Okay, this is Physics 1A for uh, Wednesday, May 19th, and uh, we are going to talk about angular impulse today. So, angular impulse is uh, basically the idea is that uh, you have a force of some kind that delivers a, a quick impact on an object. Um, and, uh, you know, we're going to look at the effect of that on generating angular speed and how it's related to angular momentum and linear momentum. So these are the kind of ideas of uh, what linear and angular impulse are going to do. So there's two different possibilities. You can have an impulse where there, there is a pivot and when there's not. We're going to look at just this part right here today. Uh, there are other problems in which there's no pivot, but we're just going to look at part B now. We're just going to look at two problems that have pivots. And uh, the, the idea here is going to be that the net impulse is equal to change in linear momentum. So you can take the impulse that's delivered plus the impulse at the pivot. So there's going to be an impulse at the pivot as well. It's going to be kind of a reaction. Uh, this is going to be equal to the change in momentum, m times v final minus v initial. And then for angular impulse, we're going to have an angular impulse term where it's basically going to be j multiplied by the distance to the pivot point. And that's going to be equal to the change in angular momentum, which is just the moment of inertia times omega final minus omega initial. So we want to use these ideas to look at uh, two different problems. Uh, and then after we're done with that, we're going to talk about the, the lesson one from the lab manual. Um, and that's what we're going to do today. OK, so, so here's the first problem. Um, a uniform rod with a mass of m and, and a length of l is pivoted at point p. So the pivot's right here. So the rod is free to swing left and right like this. But it's just hanging like this right here at rest. It says an impulse J is delivered to the other end E of the rod here. We want to find the velocity of the center of mass and the angular speed about P after the impulse. And we also want to find the linear impulse which arises at the pivot P. Okay, so just to be uh, make sure we're on the same page here. Does the word impulse, I mean, do you understand what, did you all understand what that means? Do you have any questions about like what the word impulse means? It's the moment that very second that object hits the other object, correct? Um, the impulse is delivered for a moment, but it's not the moment itself. It's just a force. It's basically just a force. You know, imagine that uh, you've got a rod that's hanging, and so you got like a rod that's hanging like this, right? And something comes along and just hits it, right? If you have a hammer or something, you, you hit it with a hammer. Um, that's what an impulse It's just a force. That's all it really is. It has units of force, too, in this case. Actually, it doesn't have units of force, does it? It's, it's as, the, the impulse is going to have units of force times time, actually, now that I think about it. So the impulse J uh, is equal to some kind of a force multiplied by the time interval over which it occurs. And these problems, it's just going to be a variable, but uh, just to be clear about what it is, it's a force delivered over some time interval, which is the time that the imp the force is, you know, actually hitting the object. The time interval is going to be really, really, really short usually, like something on the order of like 20 milliseconds or something like that. So, so fast that it looks instant. As fast as a tennis racket hits a tennis ball or something like that, or a baseball hits a bat. Okay. So we want to find velocity of center mass and omega about p. So we're going to be using these two equations over here. Um, and we have all the information on the problem. So uh, the first equation we're going to use is this one right here. We want to find the velocity of the center of mass and the angular speed about the pivot. So we have the impulse j down here. Whenever you hit an object like this that has a pivot up here at the top, there's also going to be a force at the pivot. And if you don't know what direction it points, you can kind of just guess. But there's also going to be another impulse at the pivot that's going to point back this way. Um, I'm going to call it J prime for the impulse at the pivot. I guess we could call it J sub p. I, don't know, I like J prime better. It's just easier to write. So there's an impulse down here, and then because 
the force hits the rod at the end, there's going to be another impulse backwards at the pivot. The direction of this force right here, or this impulse, uh, it might be to the right, but it's okay to just pick a direction and let the math help you figure out what direction it points, as we'll see in the next problem. So um, this, this could actually be pointing to the right, but we'll figure that out in a second. Okay, so we take uh, basically the impulse J plus J prime, oops, and this should be equal to the mass of our object, which in this case is capital M, multiplied by um, the velocity before the impulse hits, uh, the difference between, so this is the velocity after the impulse and this is the velocity before the impulse. And these are both vectors too. In this case, J prime is pointing to the left, so I'm gonna write this as J minus J prime is equal to. We're gonna say that the rod was originally hanging at rest, and what we're trying to find is the velocity of the center of mass. So the center of mass of this object is gonna be right here at C. That's the velocity that we're gonna calculate. That's gonna be V final that we're calculating here. And this is really gonna give us the velocity just after the impulse ends. So we have uh, M times V final. Okay, and um, now we can't really do much with this because our goal is to find what the velocity of the center of mass is, but we don't know what this is. This is an unknown. Uh, we can treat J as if it's a known. Our answer can have J in it, but J prime shouldn't show up. In fact, this is gonna be one of the things we're gonna have to calculate in part B. So this equation doesn't actually get us what we need. So we need another equation. So the other equation is gonna be the angular impulse. So just like with torque, to get rotational force, you take distance times force. To get angular impulse, you're gonna take the distance from point P to E, which is L, and you're gonna multiply that by J for your angular impulse. So you take J times L. This is gonna be your angular impulse. And this should be equal to the moment of inertia times omega final minus omega initial. But again, uh, just like before, uh, the initial velocity was zero, also the initial angular speed is zero. So to find the angular speed about P, we just have to find omega final right here. We can plug in what um, I is equal to. This is gonna be the moment of inertia of the rod about one end, which is one third times M times L squared times omega final. And then we can just solve this. One of these L's will cancel out. And what we'll get is uh, 3j over ml. That's going to be what we get for omega final. We can check to make sure these units make sense. Since j has units of force times time, the units of this would be like newtons times seconds in the, in the numerator divided by um, kilograms times length. which would be meters. So the units that we would get out of this would be the, the Newton is kilogram times meter per second squared times seconds divided by kilogram times meters. And what we're left over with here after we cancel everything out, like the kilograms and meters cancel out, seconds over seconds squared. So you get basically one over seconds, which is good. That's the units of, it would be radians per second, but that's fine. Um, okay, so this is our angular speed. Okay, that's half of what we wanted to find. We also want to find the velocity of the center of mass. Now, as we said, this other equation didn't really help us out with that because it introduced this new variable, J prime. So how else can we figure out the velocity about the, of the center of mass then? This VF right here. This is the v VCM. How can we calculate what that is? without using this equation. What other relationship do we know about that can help us find what the velocity of that center mass is? use linear momentum. So this basically is linear momentum right here. So we can't really 
I uh, can't use that. And we also just used angular momentum right here. Omega is equal to V over L. That is close. So what you want to use is basically the relationship that says that tangential velocity is equal to like R times Omega, right? That's what you want to do, right? This will work. So this uh, VCM is basically a tangential velocity. The distance we want to use though is not L. We want to use the distance to this point right here, which is L over two. The thing is that um, the whole rod is going to have the same angular speed. Like if the angular speed was 10 radians per second, for example, every piece of the rod has the same angular speed. And then the tangential speed is dependent on how far you are away from the center. So at point P, there's no tangential speed because you're right at the axis. And then right here, there's your tangential speed is going to be the angular speed times L over 2. So we can find what V final is, which is equal to the velocity of the center of mass by taking um, L over 2 multiplied by omega, which would be equal to L over 2 times 3J over ML. That's not a J. So we end up getting the V final, which is also the velocity of the center of mass, is going to be equal to one of the L's cancels out. So we have 3J over 2M. And the units of this will be meters per second. Did that make sense? Anyone have any questions? Um, I had actually had a question on how'd you get the JL in the angular impulse part? Yeah, so, okay, the way this is written is kind of confusing, but this is what angular impulse is. So, so what's regular impulse? A regular impulse is just a force multiplied by a time. So to get angular impulse, you have to take that and multiply by the distance to where the angular impulse was applied. Why does that matter? Okay, so this force J, right? It was, it was applied at the end, right? This impulse was applied at the end of the rod, right? Yes. And we got this answer for our angular speed. So just tell me, what do you think would happen if I take this force J and instead of hitting it at the end, I hit it in the center? Do you think the angular speed would be bigger or smaller? Smaller? No, it'd be bigger because it's a lever. It's like, it's like a lever, right? Let me ask the question in a different way. Suppose that you walk into a revolving door. So you, you have a, like a revolving door, okay? And we're looking at it from, from above, right? And you want to make the door revolve as fast as you can, let's say. And I give you two options. You can either stand right here and push this way, or you can stand right here and push this way. Which one is going to be easier to revolve the door? Definitely the one closer to the middle. Nope, that's just not right. Why do you think oh. that? Have you ever... I'm sorry. That, that's not right. Cons Someone I've never else. been to a revolving door. I mean, I've never okay. been to a Okay, door. so, so let's, just, let's just say that it's a door then. You want to open a door, right? And you have the choice of opening a door. So here's a hinge right here. What is, the, what is the easiest way to open the door? Is it easier to open the door if you push like over here near the hinge? Or is it easier to open the door when you push toward <laughs> this way? Definitely at the end. Okay, so it's the same concept. <laughs> it's exactly the same concept. So for angular impulse... You have to multiply, you have to take the impulse and you have to multiply by the distance you are away from the pivot because you're going to get a bigger angular impulse if you're farther away. You're going to generate kind of like more torque, basically, if you want to think about it that way. Does that make sense? Definitely makes sense. Appreciate okay. it. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Um, does anyone else have any, have any questions? Okay. So the last part was to find the linear impulse which arrives at the pivot. So this is going to end up being part B, what we started off with here. Okay. So we're looking to calculate J prime, and we just found V final. So we can just say that um, J minus MV final is going to be equal to J prime. And then we just plug in um, our numbers. So we have 3J over 2M that we're going to plug in here. So we have M times 3J over 2M. And I'm pretty sure this is going to give us a negative answer, which is totally fine. So it looks like the answer is going to be, so M and M cancel. 
So we have j minus 3 half j, which I think is going to be equal to j over 2 with a negative sign. Do you, you all agree with that? Does that look right? Okay. So that means that I made a mistake in the way that I, I set up the force right here. It's actually pointing this way, right? It's actually going that way. And how do I know that? Well, because the math made it work out that way, right? That there, this is this is a really interesting thing that happens here. I'm going to go ahead and switch the direction, but I'm also going to go through here and I'm going to change the math because I I want to I want to kind of, oops, I want to use a different color though to indicate that I've changed something. So we said it was going to be j plus j prime, but then I said I think j prime points to the left, but I was wrong. It actually is pointing. Here, let's use red. That'll stand out better. So let's make it a plus sign right here. Uh, which would mean that uh, our equation right here would have to be reversed, I think. This would become negative, and this would become positive, and this would become negative, and this would become positive, and then our answer would have been plus j over 2. So this is what our, our impulse at the pivot is. It's equal to j over 2, and it points to the right. Okay. Now, I didn't know to begin with which way it pointed. I just picked a direction, worked out the math, got an answer, and then went back and, and changed it. So. This is kind of, I don't know, what do, you, what do you all think? Are you all in any way surprised that there's a... I think yesterday I had I was trying to convince you all that there would be a force here, first of all. Um, and now that we can see, that we can calculate what it would be, are you all surprised that it goes to the right instead of to the left? Kind of, right? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, and you can you can kind of... Do this yourself. If you walk up to a door, right? So you've got to like just take an open door in your house, right? If you what this is implying is that if you were to come and hit the door in this direction with the force, that the door itself would exert a force this way also. That's basically what this is saying, right? And it is pretty. It's pretty surprising, I think. It turns out that depending on where you hit the object. The direction of that force will change, and that's what we're going to look in the next problem. Um, but uh, one thing that's I think kind of interesting is um, you need this force, okay, to actually be able to give it a speed this large. If that makes any sense, right? Because what this, if you look at what this equation right here says, it says that the final velocity is related to not just this force down here at the bottom, but also the force at the top, right? The sum of these two forces is what defines what the final velocity is. So you kind of you need both of those forces to make it go as fast as it happens to go. I think that's definitely surprising, but that's okay. Things in physics can be surprising. That's why we you know use the math to work things out. So let's investigate this idea a little further with the next problem. So this problem kind of generalizes what we just did. Oh, I guess I can wait a second because people are typing. Are there any other questions that or comments? So overall, the, the force at the pivot point, the impulse at the pivot point is going at the same direction. Yeah, we were we yeah. were assuming it goes at the opposite direction. Was that right. it? Yeah, I assumed it went to the left. You work out the math and you get a negative number, right? Which tells you that it has to actually go the other way, basically, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. And I also made it go left because I think intuitively that's that, that's kind of what that's what we would think it would be. Because we're used to the idea of like I hit something and it pushes back on me, right? Like I push on a wall, the wall pushes back on me. Well, and then other well the other thing is like I, maybe the intuition, the real intuition that most people would have is that there is no force at the pivot because it seemed like that's what people were saying yesterday, right? Is that right? Would you all kind of in general, if the question didn't ask to find this, would you just assume that there is no force here? You think, okay, this thing's just going to rotate maybe? You would assume, okay, yeah. So I guess that the natural intuition is there is no pivot force. And then if I asked you to define what direction it would point, most people would probably say it goes left, I think. And then... Okay, so let's try this problem here, where we can get a general idea of what's going on with this. 
So it says a uniform rod, it's a very similar problem, is pivoted at point P, it's resting on a horizontal frictionless surface. It's not actually hanging as it turns out, it's just kind of like, so it is very much like a door that's able to swing like this. Um, an impulse J is delivered to a point D, which is a distance X from the pivot point. So now this is just a variable. And we want to find the angular speed about P after the impulse. We want to find J prime, which is the impulse caused by the pivot in terms of LX, et cetera. And then we want to find the distance x such that j prime is equal to zero. This point is called the center of percussion, also known as the sweet spot. Okay, so this is our setup, and let's uh, let's go through it. The first thing to do is to find the angular speed. So let's again here draw a direction for j prime on our picture. I'm just gonna. Eh. I guess we'll make it point this way. That's fine, right? Yeah. So we'll have it point this way. So this is J prime. We're gonna we're gonna look well. Yeah. So we want to find the angular speed. For this, we're gonna use the angular impulse definition, which says that the angular impulse is equal to the change in angular momentum. So the angular impulse is defined as J multiplied by the distance from the pivot to where the where the impulse is applied in this case, which is X. And this is equal to the change in angular momentum, which is I times omega final minus omega initial. So the initial angular speed before the object gets hit is zero. So we're just solving for omega final here. So we're gonna have J times X is equal to I, which is one over three ml squared times omega final. And this gives us an answer that omega final is equal to J x times 3 divided by m. L squared. That's part A. Okay, part B. Let's go over here. Part B says to find J prime, the impulse caused by the pivot in terms of L, X, etc. So in order to do that, um, we're going to use the other equation, which says that um, basically just the total impulse, we'll just write it like this, impulse is equal to the change in momentum of the center of mass of the object. So the impulse is going to be J plus j prime, because we have those two forces, this should be equal to the change in the, mo the momentum of the center of mass, which is going to be the mass of our object, times the v final of the center of mass minus v initial. And v initial is going to be 0. We have to look at where the center of mass is again. The center of mass is right in the center, so this is where our v final is going to be defined. So we have, again, j plus j prime is equal to now just m times v final. And once again, we are left with kind of too many unknowns because our goal here is to find j prime, but in order to find j prime, we're going to need to know what v final is. But just like in the previous problem, we can basically say that since we know what omega is, right, what do we do? What did what, I do in the last problem? How do I find v final? Sub to our omega for our rw well well velocity is rw so omega should be um no no we're so you're right yeah we're going to multiply by the the radius basically the distance from the pivot to where the velocity is which in this case is going to be l over 2 right just like the last problem this equation only refers to what happens with the center of mass when you have extended objects like this so that's why i'm using l over 2 here is because that's where the center of mass is and not some other random point so if this is what v final is, we can plug it into our equation here. So we'll have j plus j prime equals. So v final is L over 2. We have m times L over 2 times omega final, which is, OK, this is kind of confusing the way that I've done this. Let me, sorry, let's, let's, let's plug this in over here. So v final is L over 2 times omega final. Omega final is right here. So we have L over 2 multiplied by 3jx divided by ml squared, which gives us an answer of 3jx divided by 2ml. 
Now we can take this, which is v final, and plug it into this equation over here. So we're going to have m times 3jx divided by 2ml. Our goal is to find j prime, so we're going to say that j prime is going to be equal to all of this minus j. So it's th the m's cancel. So it's 3jx over 2l minus j. Or if we factor the j out, it's equal to j times 3x over 2l minus 1. And that is what j prime is in terms of the variables that are given in our problem. So this gives us a general answer for what happens when you hit a rod like this with some impulse for finding the impulse at the pivot. That's what J prime is. This is the impulse at the pivot caused by the pivot, as it says. Now, if we look at this equation right here, we can kind of plug in values to see if it makes any sense. So if I plug in, um, so if X is equal to L, what do I get for J prime? J over two, yeah, exactly. And that's what we got in the last problem, right? Okay. What if we picked like L over two? What if we picked like if X was equal to L over two, what would we get for J prime? Yeah, is it positive or negative, though? J over 4 is, is right, but is it positive or is it negative? I think it's negative, right? Yeah. Okay, so what does that mean? What direction is the force in this case? To the left. To the left, yeah. So you see what I mean? That like the, the, the point where you actually hit the rod changes the direction of the force. I find that really interesting. Uh, that the force is going to point to the left if you hit it somewhere like right here. Okay. So then the last part says to find the distance x such that j prime is equal to zero. So if we want to set j prime equal to zero, then that means that j times 3x over 2l minus 1, that this is equal to zero which means either j is zero. So if j is zero, this is obvious. If the impulse down here is zero, then there is going to be no impulse at the pivot. That should be obvious. So that's one possibility. The other possibility is that 3x, 3x over 2l minus 1 has to be equal to zero, which means that 3x over 2l equals 1, which means that x is equal to two-thirds L, I think, right? So this, this point right here, would be what they call the center of percussion. When you hit it at this point, there is no impulse at the pivot. Not at all. And this is also called the sweet spot. And on something like a bat, the sweet spot is about two-thirds uh, away from uh, the hilt, or whatever, the, the base like on a baseball bat, which is kind of shaped a little bit like this, where it gets a little bit thicker towards the end, the sweet spot is basically somewhere like right around here. And the idea is that if you hit a baseball right at that spot, you're going to get the maximum kind of like force out of your swing, pretty much, depending on how hard you're swinging it. And the other thing, and this might be something that you all kind of have some knowledge of, when you hit the object on the sweet spot, you're holding, you're holding the bat over here, right? Like your hand is right here. This is where your hands are, right? When you hit the object on the sweet spot, you don't feel a sting at your hands. Do you all know what I'm talking about? Like if you hit a baseball bat with a with a baseball and you hit it like somewhere off, 
you're going to feel a sting in your hands, right? Especially when it's cold outside, which I know doesn't get cold here very often, but especially when it's cold outside and it can kind of like rattle your bones almost. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? The same thing happens in tennis too. The exact same thing happens in tennis. Or I anything. Anything where you hit like a ball or something like that. Are you talking about the, the vibration that you usually get? Yes. And... Yeah. Yeah, exactly. If you haven't experienced this before, you, you can you can go try it out yourself, I guess, if you want to. If you just like take a, a rod of some kind, a stick, a ruler, a bat, whatever you've got, a tennis, whatever, and you know try to figure out where the sweet spot is by bouncing the ball off of your object. And you'll notice that like when you hit it, you know, in just the right spot, you're not going to feel near as much vibration at your hands, if that's what you want to call it, or a sting. Okay, does anyone have any questions? Do you all want to do one more of these problems? We, we solved those much faster than I thought we would. I forgot they're a little bit short. There is one other problem we can do that's pretty good, I think. Let's do it. All right, let's do this one here. Unless I'm thinking about another class, I think that there's a problem like this on your homework. It might not be exactly like this, but something similar. Okay, this, all right. we have to really do uh, English units for this problem, which kind of sucks, but all right. So a rod with a mass of 0.2 slugs. I don't think we've done any problems that have slugs in them yet, have we? Maybe we have. Did we do any problems yet in which we had slugs? Do you guys know what a slug is? In, in, like the, in, those rubber balls, or, no. or are you talking about like the bullets of a shotgun? That's also a slug, or a, is that what that's called? Um, a slug is the um, English version of mass, because in English units, we normally think of mass in terms of weight, right? If you if someone were to ask you, I'm, I'm, no, no one's ever going to ask you what your mass is, right? But if you want to know how heavy something is in like in the metric system, you would give kilograms as your answer, right? If you wouldn't weigh yourself on a metric scale, it would most likely give your answer in kilograms, not newtons. Would you guys agree with that? If you go to the gym and you pick up a barbell and it has like a weight written on it, it's either going to be written, like let's say it's a 10 pound weight, right? It's either going to say 10 pounds or it's going to say five kilograms, right? It's not going to say, uh, 50 newtons or something, right? Okay. But in, so, so, so there's this weird dynamic where like we have like pounds and kilograms, but they're not the same unit, right? Kilograms are actually mass and you need mass in a lot of scenarios um, instead of weight. For example, like this is a really good example right here. We, this needs to be mass. It can't be weight, right? When you're talking about moment of inertia, this has to be mass. It can't be weight, right? So, that means that if you're going to do physics problems or engineering problems using English units, you need a definition of mass, right? So one slug, which is a mass, is equal to, how is it defined then? So it's defined as one pound, and then you have to divide by gravity. So you have to divide by 32 feet per second squared. That's one slug, right? Yeah, because then if this times this would give you a pound, right? Because the definition is that weight is equal to mg. So that means that mass is equal to weight divided by gravity. So yeah, so one slug is one pound divided by 32 feet per second squared. That means that, how much is that? Let's see. What's one over 32? So 0.03 slugs is a pound, basically. This is 0 0.03125. Okay, I've confused myself completely now. Because if this equals 0 0.03, this is probably, that's probably how many slugs it is. I don't know what one slug would be then. So one slug would be this times 32 probably, right? Okay, this is where, okay, I've, I've realized the limits of my understanding. I'm gonna get, like, take a look at the textbook. So one moment, I apologize. I don't wanna tell you something that's wrong. 
You can also just look this up on the internet, but might as well use the textbook if it'll open. Doesn't seem like this wants to open. I have to just go to the internet. Nope, nope, there we go. All right, um, so where's this gonna be? This is gonna be at the end, right? Cover two, index, credits. It's gonna be appendices, maybe? Okay, there we go. Here we go. Well, <laughs> this doesn't actually tell us what it, does, what it is, does it? It says one slug is 15 kilograms. So we can actually convert from kilograms back to pounds then if we want to, right? Because one kilogram is 2.02. Okay, yeah, I think it's going to be 32. I think it's going to be 32 pounds. We'll see. It has to be, right? Now that I think about it. So if we take 14.59 and we multiply by... Yeah, you just worked it out, right? So I think it's 32. It must be... One slug must be 32 pounds. I, I must have gotten this uh, this backwards. So I think that the way you would do it is using this equation. And you 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 define the slug like this. You'd put right. You'd put one slug right here, and you'd multiply by gravity, which is nine not nine point eight. Now you have to use thirty two feet per second squared, and that would give you thirty two pounds, right? Okay, that's how it's defined. I was defining it backwards, right? I was saying this was one pound. Okay, so one slug is about thirty two pounds. That means one slug is huge, right? It's it's a it's a big measurement, right? Okay, so, um, oh, I see now that you had copy-pasted this into the thing. Thanks, Alicia. All right, so, anyway, maybe maybe now after talking through all that, I kind of want to just convert everything. <laughs> do you guys want to do that? You want to just convert everything to kilograms so we're less confused? I think we should do that. Yeah. Okay, so from our picture that we have right there, it says that one slug is equal to 14.59 kg. We're also going to need to convert feet to meters, and I think for that we have one foot is, I think it's 3.28 3 feet is equal to a meter, right? I know, I'm, to, I'm just forgetting all these things. One meter, one foot is 30 centimeters, which would be 3.0048 meters, right? So one foot is 0.3048 meters. Okay, there we go. That's all we need, right? Okay, so in this problem we have 0 0.2 slugs, which we would multiply by 14.59 kg. That's a four. Per slug. So that's gonna be 2.918 kg. We might just call it three. We might just end up calling this three. And then two feet. So two feet times 0 0.3048 meters divided by one foot. So that's going to be 0.6 meters. Yeah, let's just call this approximately three kilograms. Okay, so we basically have a mass of three kilograms and a length L. So L is going to be the length of this rod right here. And let's use let's curly L because there's angular momentum in this problem, I think. So this times 0. 0.6 meters. Okay. Oh, we have to convert four feet. Well, four feet will then be twice this, basically, right? So 0. 0.3048 times two. And then four feet is going to be about 1.2 meters. Okay, so the height, we'll call this h. Height h is 1.2 meters. Okay, let's actually read the problem now. Okay, so we have a rod. It's sitting on top of a table right here. It's balanced upright at the edge of a table that's four feet high. The rod is hit with an impulse j at its lower end, so there's the impulse down here. The rod flies off the table and it makes exactly one revolution and lands upright on the floor below. So basically it's hit here, it flips backwards one time, so it kind of like flies through the air like this, it gets hit, 
and then it kind of flips through the air, and then when it gets to the ground, it lands like on its edge. We want to find the impulse J required, and we want to find the horizontal distance D traveled by the rod. Okay. So there's two different things going on here. Uh, we have an impulse, and then we have projectile motion with rotation, basically. There's quite a bit going on then. So to find the impulse J required. As usual with problems like this, I don't immediately know like what I'm supposed to do to find the impulse J. So the best thing to do in that case is just to start to write down whatever equations we know that involve the impulse J. And that's going to be the two equations that we, we started this class with, which are up here. Here. We can copy paste this down here for now. And use it and then move it away. So those are the equations we want to use. Um, so this is actually a problem that's a no pivot problem, right? So now the net impulse is going to be directly equal to the change in linear momentum. There is no longer the pivot. That's really the difference between these two. There's no there's no force at the pivot anymore because this object can basically freely rotate, right? So let's write these equations down. So the first equation is that the impulse J should be equal to the mass of our object, which I'm using capital M, I guess, multiplied by the final velocity minus the initial velocity. And both of these will be velocities of the center of mass. That's what we're going to care about here, the velocity of the center of mass. OK. All right. And the initial velocity of our object is going to be 0. This is the velocity before it's hit. So it's standing upright. So this is 0. So now we have this relationship that j is equal to m times, um, I don't want to write vfcm every single time. I just wanted to write that down to indicate that that's what we're talking about. How about we just call it V? Is that okay with you all? Because I think this is going to be the only velocity we care about in this problem. And then I'll just label it right here that this is our velocity. Okay. So this is V. So we know J is equal to M times V. The other equation that we can write down is the other the um, the angular impulse equation. For the angular impulse equation, now it says we have to use the center of mass. So we have to use the moment of inertia about the center of mass. And when we define the angular impulse term, we have to use the distance from the center of mass. So basically this distance right here, which is going to be j times l over 2. Because the reason for this is because when you hit an object like this, it's going to naturally tend to rotate about its center of mass. In fact, if you were to track the center of mass of this object as it falls, which is indicated by this dotted line on this graph right here, it would trace out like a semi-parabola, like a half parabola. Because even though it's rotating, it's still a projectile. And it's basically just going to be rotating and moving as a projectile. And the center of mass is going to trace out the path of a projectile, which is, you know, a semi-parabola. OK, so since it rotates about the center of mass, when we define the angular impulse, we have to have it rotate about like that, about the center of mass. So the angular impulse is going to be um, from that distance, basically, half the half the rod. OK, so then j times L over 2 is equal to the moment of inertia about the center of mass. This is, again, a rigid rod like all these problems have been. So this is going to be the moment of inertia about the center of mass of that rod, which is 1 12th ml squared. And then we just need to multiply that by omega final minus omega initial, where omega initial is going to be 0. So we get that, uh, let's see, so j, one of these l's will cancel, the 2 in this will cancel, we'll get the j times, yeah, just j times nothing, j equals uh, 1 over 6 ml times omega. So we're just going to call the angular speed omega here. I don't want to write omega final every time. OK, so those are the two equations that we have. And we're trying to find what the impulse needs to be. But we have to use the other pieces of information that we've been given in the problem. What else do we know that can help us to figure this out? Now we actually have numbers in this problem, right? 
So we're not just looking for a symbolic answer for J, like we were in the previous problems. We're looking for an answer, like a number, basically, right? It makes exactly one revolution. Exactly. It says uh, it makes exactly one revolution as and lands upright on the floor. So how, what can we what can we do with that piece of data or that piece of information? How can we use that? Does that tell us something about any of these other variables that I wrote down? Is there anything else that we could calculate in this problem that I haven't already calculated? We can find the, um, the time in the air. Yeah, the time in the air, exactly. How can we, we figure can, that out? We can use the equation of kinematics. Yeah, we can use kinematics to find the time. Okay, so there's going to be some time. We know that it falls a distance of four feet, right? So let's do a little kinematic problem. I'm going to move this down. So, in fact, let's just delete it because it's, it's higher up in the notes anyway. So. We'll leave this, these pieces of information behind. And now we're going to say that we basically have a kinematic problem where I'm just going to look at the y direction and say in the y direction, we have delta y is equal to the negative of the height. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, sorry, let me put a coordinate system on here. This is going to be positive y in this direction and positive x in this direction. So delta y is going to be equal to negative 1.2 meters. Um, the acceleration in the y direction is going to be negative 9.8 meters per second squared. And we also know one other piece of information in the y direction. What is that? Repeat that one more time. We have one other piece of information in the y direction about what's going on with this object, what is it? And the velocity in the y direction? Yeah, what's it equal to? Gonna equal to zero because there's no angle, yep. it's a linear. Yeah, it's moving in a straight line to begin with, right? So the initial velocity in the y direction is zero. So we can take all of these variables right here and we can plug them into this equation. The y initial is zero, so that term goes away. Our goal here is to find the time. So if we do two times delta y divided by, this should be a sub y, uh, divided by a sub y, and then we take, ugh, sorry about that, y. Take the square root of this. This should be equal to the time, which should be equal to the square root of two times negative 1.2 divided by negative 9.8. I'm gonna. I'm kind of interested to know if we get the same answer if we put this into the units given in the problem. So I might actually check that. So this is gonna be. Zero point two four five seconds. Since I did heavy amounts of rounding, these answers shouldn't be the same, but they should be close. So if I put two times four, so I'm gonna do this in English units. So if we do 2 times 4 and then divide by 32. Oh, I didn't take the square root of the other answer. Whoops. We have to square root this. So we get pretty much the exact same answer. So I got, I'm just going to call it 0.5 seconds. You get exactly 0.5 seconds if you use the data given in the problem you get 0.495, so it's pretty much the exact same answer. So that's our time in the air, right? Okay, so let's go back. What were you we trying to figure out? What can we use this to do? We're going to take this plus the fact that it makes exactly one revolution. What can we use that information to solve? The time plus the one revolution. I don't mean actually adding them, but those two pieces of information. Yeah, we can find omega, the angular speed. So let's do that. So if we know the time, 
uh, we can now find the angular speed because angular speed is equal to, basically it's equal to the number of radians that the object rotates through. How many is that in this case? If it goes through one revolution, how many radians is that? Two pi. Two pi, so we just take two pi and we divide by 0 0.5 seconds. The two pi does have units, so I should write them, two pi radians. So our answer is going to be, it looks like four pi uh, radians per second. And we might as well put that into an actual number. It's gonna be 12.6 or whatever, let's see. Four pi, pi times four. 12.6, so omega is equal to 12.6 radians per second. So now that we know omega, I think we have enough information to find j from here. So continuing down on this path, we have j is equal to one over six times the mass. The mass is equal to uh, three kilograms. And the length was 0 0.6 meters. It's two feet tall. Oh, so that's why this picture looks so weird is because this is supposed to be four feet and this is supposed to be twice as big. Okay, anyway. Um, so we do three kilograms times L, which is 0.6 meters. And then we don't square this or anything, right? Yeah. Did I do this math right? M, L, one half, multiply the two, one sixth, yeah, okay. Uh, and then we multiply by omega, which is 12.6 radians per second. And we end up getting J equals Three point seven eight, and the units are going to be kilogram meter per second. Let me see if those units make sense. Yeah, because it's supposed to have units of force times time, right? So this is like newton seconds. So yeah, it makes sense. So that's J. Do we have any questions about that? Um, just a quick question. How did you get the delta y again? Because I thought it was four feet. Should it, shouldn't it be negative four? Oh, I converted the four feet to um to meters right here. Oh yeah, it's okay. It's four feet. My bad. Right. You can do it. You can do it in the. Um, you can do the whole thing in uh, in feet if you want to. If we did it in feet, wouldn't we have to convert like a sub y to be like thirty two meters yes. a second? Exactly. I did that in this calculation just to check, and you get the same answers for the time. Omega would be the same, too. Gotcha. Uh, this would be different because the answer would be in slug feet per second. So the, the answer would be different. Okay, last part. Find the horizontal distance D traveled by the rod. How do we, how do, we do that? We can use the equation of kinematics again. Kinematics, exactly. But we have to find the velocity first, right? So we use this equation to find velocity. So if we take J and we divide by mass, according to that equation right there, that's gonna be equal to our velocity. So let's calculate what that is. So this is 3.78. Divide by the mass, which was three kilograms. And we get Oops. 1.26. Okay, I could have done that in my head, I guess, but whatever. This is meters per second. That's V. And then to find D, D is just going to be equal to that velocity times the time. So D is equal to 1.26 per second times the time in the air, which we found was 0.5 seconds. So this is going to be half of this, which would be 3, 1, 63, right? 0 0.63? Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Does anyone have any questions? Does that all make sense?